Well, hello and welcome to Books and Beyond. I'm Jimmy Bennett, your host. Uh, this is the show where we hope to help people personify their aspirations. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to the CAPA organization, the Connecticut Office and Publishers Association of Connecticut. Um, there's uh, multi chapters in the state. It's a great organization for anybody who wants to write or playwright or illustrate, publish, uh, be an agent. Um, you can find our websites, our Facebook pages, um, and please check us out. The Southeastern Connecticut chapter has a meeting every Monday, uh, every third Monday of the month um, on Zoom now, of course, you know, during the pandemic. So, um, and actually that's how I met my guest today. She was referred to me through Jack Levine from the Southwestern uh, CAP organization. And we got a lot to get to because she is a multi-talented and uh, very, very busy um, creative creative individual. Uh, Amy Osreicher? Yeah. Hey, and how are you doing today, Amy? I'm good. How are you? Tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll, uh, we'll jump right in. Okay. Well, I'm a uh... The shortest way to say it is I'm a creative fireball. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love um, using the arts, whether it be theater or music or writing um, to um, express um, my own story and to help get other people to share their stories. And, um, and I wrote a book about it. <laughs> now, I want to uh, let's let's start touching on a few things that really kind of interested me. You have uh, something you call the four skills for resilience. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So these are things I discovered in retrospect because um, the book is called My Beautiful Detour because my life took a detour. Um, kind of like the detour we're all experiencing now during this pandemic where my life had changed and I woke up in an uh, in an ICU um, my senior year of high school to find out that, you know, I had no stomach anymore and I might not ever be able to eat or drink again. And no one could tell me when or if that would happen, which turned into almost seven years and nearly 30 surgeries. Um, so I was discharged from the hospital feeling like, a, you know, an 18 year old, like finally feeling better. Like I want to be in the world. I want to go to college that I had applied to. Um, so what do I do when I want to be in the outside world, but I'm in this kind of, you know, limbo period. And so I use resources. I realized that I just had. Um, and the good part about these skills is because I had to just like look inside and see what I could find. I found that we all have these skills and sometimes we need to be pushed to the point where we need to use them and anyone can use them right now. So what I realized, um, the first is uh, creativity. Um, creativity is not for artists. You know, you don't have to paint or be a singer to consider yourself creative. I think of creativity as energy. It's how we get the physical feelings we're feeling without having to label them with words or having to think them out. Because sometimes the best way to process what we're feeling isn't to like really intellectually think, oh my God, what am I feeling and analyze it. Um, I think that can even wrap us up in like a victim mode. But when I discovered various forms of creativity, because before all this, I just knew musical theater, but I was forced to discover, you know, art and all these other beautiful ways to express myself. Um, it was a way to see my world differently. Um, my second one is hope. And these four words are going to seem like very cheesy, like, Hallmark words you get on like an inspirational poster, but they're so basic that they actually work. Um, hope is not like this inspirational beam of light that just 
comes to us and we're like, ah, I feel hope. You know, it's not baseless, wishful thinking. Hope is something we have to actively create. Um, and one of the first things I did to create hope when I got home from the hospital is I made a big countdown on my wall that said like seven days till I can eat again, six days, five days. When it got to zero, I just flipped it over again for years because I was like envisioning that athlete's finish line and that made it closer to me. Um, the third one is stories. Um, I, I'll, I won't say too much about this because I know uh, we're short for time, but by discovering, you know, stories from mythology to fairy tales to um, all these stories around me that I was hearing, I realized that some stories took on this hero's journey, like whether it was Star Wars or The Wizard of Oz. And because my life had no roadmap at this point, I latched on to those stories that I would read and I would be like, I don't have a calendar. Doctors don't know what's going on, but you know what? I'm going to pretend like I'm a hero on a hero's journey and go through those steps. And even creating this like fake timeline and path for myself made it easier for me to see the next step. And then the last one is gratitude. Um, not just to suck it up and say, okay, you know, I'm grateful I'm alive. I'll deal with this. Um, gratitude, once I started making daily gratitude lists after my 27th surgery, when I almost had it, um, I realized that all those things I was grateful for when I did that consistently every day, they were showing me what my values were. And I realized that no matter what happened to me medically, my values always told me what was important to me as a person and where to go next. So anyway, um, that was how I dealt with a very, very uncertain period of time in my life. And thankfully, I can eat and drink now. But I realized that now in this pandemic, when we're all dealing with this uncertainty of like, when is this going to end? And like, how many steps do we have to take? And they told us it would be three months. Now it's nine months. I mean, these are skills I'm going back to. And and I find it, they're really helpful for everyone too. So, yeah. That's, you know, that's a, that's really wonderful points because in this time, uh, I've been encouraging people to whatever talent you might have. And pe everybody has a talent. Everybody has something that they're good at, or they don't, they might not even know. Or um, that they're passionate about or curious about. Right. You and, go and see. And you've got to, you've got to, you've got to, you have the time to explore these things. And it does, it helps pass the time and it helps focus you and, you know, makes you feel, I do it with writing. You know, I sit down and I write every night. Um, but I do, I do paint a little bit and do other things. But, um, you know, now that you, it's harder now because you're, you're, you're confined. So you need to learn how to, uh, to express yourself and to get through this. Um, it's harder now, but you can find creativity within those limitations. Cause believe it or not, I bet once this is all over, there are moments we'll go back to and be like, you know what? I kind of miss that feeling of, so there's no reason why we can't find something in this moment right now. And those are what I found are the flowers on our detours, those unexpected flowers that we would have never come into contact with had we not been forced on this path. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I got to say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I don't want to uh, bring up any unpleasant, but how did you manage not to? How did you get through not eating or drinking for seven years? And oh, my Lord. That's why my book is so long. Um, it, I would be lying if I wouldn't say it was, was not, like, ridiculously difficult. And I, that I got into so many different things. Like, you become obsessed with the things you can't have. And, like, I needed to do something sensory with my hands. 
I wanted an excuse to go grocery shopping. So I got the idea to start decorating chocolates. And soon enough, I started a chocolate business and was like shipping out little Christmas chocolate packages to places all over. Um, what really saved me was the power of theater and community because a month after I was discharged from the ICU, I convinced my parents to let me audition for a community production of Oliver. Um, and at this point, I just got out of the hospital. I was just learning to walk again. I thought, you know, being on the, in the ensemble would be a good community experience. I ended up getting the lead and I couldn't drink anything or eat, but just being with people that reminded me of doing what I love just got me through at least the first few months. And then from then, I just went, you know, I kept myself busy because it, it was hard to really, you know, think too much when you couldn't eat. My mom would always freak out worrying I'd like forget and eat a pretzel or something. So, you know, I had to distract myself for many, many years. But in those distractions, I learned a lot of new skills. Um, so, again, you don't know what you're capable of until you're tested. And I knew I wanted to live and I knew there would be an end to it or hoped. Yep. You uh, Now, your book is called My Beautiful Detour. Yeah. Right. And so tell me about the Love My Detour movement. Yeah, so I believe me, I did not think of this as a beautiful detour, let alone a detour, until actually um, in 2012, um, I decided to take all the journaling I had done throughout all of this. Um, I had written some songs. Um, I, uh, I was on the Today Show and Kathy Lee Gifford and David Freeman wrote a song for me. And um, I was like, you know what? I have always loved theater, but I'm not gonna just do musical theater. I'm gonna put my own show together about my own life. And I premiered my one woman musical, Gutless and Grateful in New York in 2012. And I had never told anyone really what happened to me from my perspective. And I was saying it for the first time on like a New York stage, which was, Let's see to begin with, but that was the first time I thought of it as a beautiful detour because in creating a script, you can't just get up there and just, you know, moan about what happened to you. You have to create a theatrical arc where I have to look at the events in my life and be like, oh, this actually led me to this. And if my life had never done this, I would have never met this person. I never would have learned this about myself. And you know what? Like, I can't even say anymore, what would I be doing had this never happened to me? Because this has made me who I am. And that's really when I started thinking, like, this was really a beautiful detour because I accepted that path and I was able to see all those flowers along the way. Um, so then um, I gave my first TED talk a, a few years after that about you know, being a detourist um, because I realized that what if we didn't think of like the uniqueness of what bad thing happened to us and instead we thought about the unique thing that it forced us to do. Um, so I created like the Love My Detour movement. I actually made a... Ooh. I made them. I always make art when I get excited about something. But I love my teacher because um, I try to start a movement saying like, hey, you know, if you've been through something in life that you didn't expect, um, then uh, you're a detourist. And all I want you to do is just write about any little unexpected thing and maybe just where it led you. And I got stories from literally all over the world everything from, you know, a, a very terrible illness to just changing jobs to having to move to like a breakup. But the whole commonality between everyone was, this wasn't what I expected, but because I ex embraced that detour, it led me here. 
And the cool part about that is calling it all a detour. It doesn't make it separate, like where we're swapping war stories of like, well, this happened to me or this happened to me. We're all traveling one detour together, no matter what that is. And I think we gain strength when we find that commonality and not when we think of like, well, your trauma is so much bigger than mine or, you know, so I wanted a way to bring people together um, and share their stories. And um, I think it really inspired a lot of people and I'm, and I'm still doing it. Um, so, you know, it's, an, it's a nice feeling, encouraging people to thrive like because of obstacles and not like in spite of them. Was it was it tough to write a memoir? I mean, was it hard to? Uh, how long did it take you? In, in... The, the, well, this this is the story of my life. Not literally, that's my memoir. But I um, I'm great at writing. I I wrote the entire thing in two years. It took me five years to edit because there was so. I mean, there was so much in in that time. Um, but so that was the tricky part, but, um, I'm really proud of, you know, all the work that, that went into it and, you know, as it is, it's a, it's a pretty hefty book, but, um, I actually just, I used the pandemic time to finally record the audio book, which just came out too. Um, and what I love about it is it really, is it really goes through all the ups and downs of everything. And also it talks about how trauma doesn't affect just the individual, it affects the you know, community. It, 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 I had so much support. Um, you know, my family had been so supportive. Um, and I talk about how this detour made other people take, you know, beautiful detours too. Um, one of my favorite things is that um, I have three brothers. Um, one of my brothers stayed in the ICU with me for the first 72 days of my coma. And I guess his way of processing this was taking his laptop and he just journaled every day from the first night where doctors said I definitely wouldn't make it through the night. Um, all the way until, you know, things are getting better and like they've settled into their new normal. And so I found those journal entries years later and I incorporated some into the beginning of the book, which is really um, special for me. Like the forward was written by the surgery, uh, the surgeon who originally saved my life. Um, the afterward is written by Tony Ward winning Bill Finn, uh, William Finn, who um, was a big mentor in my life. So um, it, I'm, I'm really, um, it means a lot to me to finally get this out there. Well, that's great. You know, I, I, I think um, I hope a lot of people will take inspiration from that because uh, everybody has a story to tell. Um, oh, and whether it's overly dramatic or funny or whatever, I, I do encourage everybody to write things down because, you know, that's our that's our link to to our past and our future and everything. You know, you, you write things down you know, so your children can see them someday or your friends or other people. Um, but to put it into a, a memoir form like that is it's an art. And I mean, it takes a lot of work, but it's a beautiful thing when you when you get it put together right like that. Especially now, you know, with what the world is going through, there are going to be generations long after this that aren't going to just want to read the facts of, you know, this pandemic affected this and this is what happens to the economy and and uh, they're, they're going to want to know how did families cope? How did people feel? Right, it? right. If everyone, I mean, if you need a reason now, like your voice will matter and it does matter now. So write a few lines and see where it takes you. Yep, I, I, think, I think that's very true. I, I, I often think to myself now, um, I think about the Spanish flu epidemic in the beginning of the 19th century, you know? Um, right. I and I, you know, you, you get the facts and they tell you this and that in the history books, but I, I haven't really ever seen anybody's firsthand account of it. It would be exactly. interesting to see, you know, how did I, you know, how did I get through this? How did I, 
you know, what, did, what precautions did I take? Um, who did I lose? Who did, you know, who made it, who, you know, and I think that that's an important lesson, you know, and it's a lesson that it would be good to pass on to the next generations. Exactly. Right. You know, um, so now I, you mentioned the audio book and that is fascinating to me because, um, you know, as an author too, uh, a lot of people are, are doing audio books. How, how was that? How did that get up, come about and, and how are you doing with that? Well, I wanted to do it for a long time. Um, and I, I wanted to narrate it myself because the book is so much in my voice. But I knew it just felt daunting to me because I knew it was a long book and, and a lot to, to narrate. Um, but then the pandemic comes and we're all confined. So I'm like, yeah, this is a great opportunity. Um, and so um, I recorded the tracks in August. Um, got them up and uh, got them uh, approved and produced, and uh, it's finally out as of last week. Oh, and, great! Uh, yes. Um, so, um, and the feedback has been great so far, and I'm I'm really proud of it because um, it also includes some of like my musical access and my performances, and even the producer guy said this is an audio book like any other. <laughs> Yeah. Together. So um I'm super excited as someone who loves audiobooks. So Yeah, that's um I mean they're they're very, very popular. A lot of people love audiobooks. Um and wow, I didn't think I didn't really think about that, but you put some of your songs in there too and stuff. That must be incredible. Why not? Why yeah. not? Yeah. Right, right. Maybe uh, that's why the producer looked at me funny when I'm like, yeah, I'm putting this and this and He's like, yeah, audiobooks don't usually do that. I'm like, I want to. Yep. That's like, great. <laughs> um, now, what was the, oh, yes. All right. So you told me about the special afterwards and the forward of your new uh, book. Now, how about your workbook, Creativity and Gratitude? Yeah. So um, I always thought I would have you know, I wanted to talk about these skills in my book, but, you know, I didn't have room to tell, like, you know, this is how you can do it yourself. Um, but then um, Apollo Publishers uh, approached me, and they wanted to um, publish, you know, a way I could do, um, like, 52 weeks of these hardcore skills to resilience, as I call them. Um, for anyone that wanted to, you know, really gain resilience and creativity and gratitude. Um, this was before the pandemic, before we really needed all that stuff. So it's perfect timing. Um, it's been so fun uh, creating exercises that I use um, and pictures and, um, and stories behind it. So that's actually... It's on pre-order now, and it'll be out on um, February 10th, which is soon. Oh, my God. Where does the time go? Yeah, um, I know. So um, I'm really excited about that because now people can actually uh, practice those. And I, I am leading workshops using those, but um, now I have a book to go with those uh, too. Which is now, tell, me, tell me about the workshops. Yeah, so, um, you know, it started out as... Um, you know, I was doing a lot of speaking after my TED Talks about, you know, the detour movement and the resilience and and all of that. And then uh, when I saw what an impact it was making with people, I wanted to help people, you know, bring that more into their everyday lives. And I also started touring my musical, Gutless and Grateful, and pairing that with like a talk back in a workshop where... I would talk about how writing my story healed me and how they can start writing their own stories. Um, so I do these like, um, you know, resilience workshops um, now virtually uh, from the pandemic, which is still a great opportunity because you know, last week I was able to um, uh, do a keynote speech for um, a university in Oklahoma uh, from my home. And I, I feel like I really made an impact um, with college students right now who are not having the typical 
college experience that they anticipated yeah. just like I did. Um, and so I find that like students um, are people that um, are really benefiting from these workshops as well as really anyone trying to deal with this uncertainty in, in a really positive way. So the virtual aspect of this pandemic has really been a gift. So that's what I'm doing now. Well, that's great. Um, and I guess the beautiful part too about uh, as much as I like to be in the studio, uh, doing doing interviews by Zoom, doing my show on Zoom, it, it's kind of nice the fact that you can go anywhere in the world, you know, without all the hassle of TSA and and travel and uh, everything else, you know. Uh, I streamed my show Bentley and Grateful in California uh, the other week uh, from the comfort of my own home. Yep, <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you one other thing, um, cause I've heard this term before and I, I hate to sound ignorant, but what, what is a Ted talk? A uh, Ted talk, um, the tagline is ideas worth spreading. Um, and you know, uh, you can look at them up, but, um, they're wonderful, like 10 to 15 minute, um, talks about an idea someone's talking about, um, and how it can really, um, change you know, the world or change others. Um, and so I've, I've given four um, since 2016. Uh, you can find them all on my website. Um, a lot of them are about how creativity is a wonderful way to transform trauma. My last one uh, was in October about how we can all play a part um, in healing our planet uh, through creativity. Um, and just great ways we can come together. Um, and they're like little like bites of ideas that have really um, inspired people. Um, so it, nice. it's really made an Very nice. to give those, yeah. Um, are you doing any plays right now um, or anything yeah. coming up? Yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm still talking about this and grateful. Um, I, premiered another Love Woman musical last year called Passageways, um, which involved um, puppetry, um, my own original songs, and 200 productions of my mixed media artwork to explore um, post-traumatic stress disorder um, and working my way through that. And um, the piece I'm working on now is about um, healing the environment, um, about the question behind it is, how can we really connect with one another if we can't even connect to our planet? And so hopefully it's going to be a call to action that we can all um, kind of acknowledge where we are. Um, and um, that's another thing I'm hoping this pandemic makes us pause and do. You know, look at, you know, climate activism in our environment and you know, what can we do about it? So, you know, everyone just take this time, look around and, um, Notice the things that you wouldn't be noticing um, if you were too busy. Um, there's a lot in the world to do. Stop and smell the roses. Well, Amy, we're running out of time. Um, I, I think I'm going to be honest. I think we're going to have to do this again. Um, yeah. I'd like to have you back on the show uh, in a while, and uh, maybe we could hear a song. Maybe you could sing a. You can sing a song for us. Don't or, tell Peter that. Okay. Hey, don't tell yep. Peter him that. I'll come on. Yep. And take All time. right. I'm ready. You call me. Yep. And um, I want, I want to, uh, now where can we, where can we find your books? So you can find my book. Um, my website lists all the places you can find it, but it, it, it's on Amazon. It's on any online retailer, um, both paperback and ebook and Kindle. Um, sure. But um, I can give my website here, and, and the audio book is available on you know Apple Books, um, all those you know, ACX, all those wonderful places which you can um, find uh, through my website as well. And uh, right. I gotta say, I'm doing a lot of art and stuff, and like. Now I make a little mask with my art. There you go. Is everyone wearing your mask? Yes, everybody wear your mask. Well, thank you very much, Amy. This was great. Um, like I said, we'll uh, we'll we'll keep in touch, and um, 
I'd like to have you back on again because there's just so much uh, to do. So this has been Books and Beyond. I'm Jimmy Bennett, your host. Thank you, and uh, please tune in for the next episode. Take care.